Welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Before we get started with panel three, I want to hand the mic over to uh, Chris Skinner, who is the graduate program director here at uh, Loyola University Chicago's theology department. Um, and I'm really grateful that Chris is joining us. And I would love for him to say something about these wonderful programs that we've all taken part in. Yeah, thanks, Megan. And hey, everybody, um, welcome back. Um, uh, I, some faces I know and uh, many other names that I don't know. I've been sort of scanning. I've been lurking since about 10 o'clock. Um, I missed I missed uh, Dan's paper and Karen's paper because of a Zoom, another Zoom meeting, but um, uh, really uh, lurking all morning and, and I'm going to be lurking some this afternoon. Um, I have to say that two thoughts have been sort of bouncing around my head all day. The, the first is that um, as a scholar of New Testament and, and Christian origins, um, much of the conversation today has been outside my uh, daily disciplinary pondering. So in that way, the conversations have been really interesting and, and helpful and compelling. Um, the second thought that I've had, honestly, though, is um, there's this deeply inspiring combination of both substance and passion that I've noticed in these presentations. Uh, and that just makes me uh, pretty proud to be associated with, uh, with you guys and also um, with these programs. Um, yeah, I'm happy to say something really quickly for those who are interested. Of course, we have MA and PhD programs in theology, ethics, uh, New Testament, early Christianity. Um, of course, uh, many people who are presenting here today are currently in the program and several others have graduated. So um, I don't know what more I can say than the work itself that's been on display here today has already said. Um, but if anybody does have questions about the programs, we want to talk more, um, I would, I'm really happy to talk to you about what we do here. Um, and I should also say that like just about an hour ago, we got the really good news that our doctoral stipends next year are going to go up from 18 grand to 28 grand starting, uh, as, as, as a normal, yeah, every, so like, we're going to be even more competitive now in terms of what we're able to offer students. So, um, that's really good news. So anyway, I think it's my job now, Megan, to turn it over to Kathy Busher, or do I turn it back to you and you turn to Kathy. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kathy Bisher. I'm also a doctoral student in the uh, program in integrative uh, ethics and theology. And so I'm glad to be able to join you this afternoon and introduce uh, the panelists for this afternoon's um, session on being publicly religious and theologically political theology and ethics in the 21st century. And our first presenter is Andy Blosser. Andy is one of our recent graduates just last spring, and he uh, did his PhD in the integrated studies in ethics and theology. And his research focused on ecological aspects of religious rituals. And he's currently teaching world religions and New Testament uh, courses at Carthage College that some of you may know that's up the um, up the shore in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and also is helping uh, teach some of the ethics courses at Loyola. Uh, prior to that, uh, prior to teaching, he worked for several years as a local church clergy person. And I find this particularly interesting because it connects with some things that I'm interested in. He's writing a book on how religion and science can work together in fostering better human moral development. And his uh, relating to our publicly religious and theologically political topic is uh, a really interesting reflection on should Christians ever argue a theological re reflection on the morality of so thank you, Andy. This is going to be a great topic for this day and age. With that, I'll turn it over. Thank you so much, Kathy. First of all, uh, is everyone able to hear me? I always do that with my students just because sometimes my microphone does have issues. So please let me know if that is a problem. First of all, I want to thank you all for having me here. And it's good to see some of the faces that I recognize uh, from past years when I was as Dr. Skinner says, lurking around the Hank Center. So um, thank you, and I hope that this is of some benefit to you. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen so that you can see my slides. Um, hopefully this works well. Um, you would think that after over a year of doing this, I would have mastered it, but apparently 
Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour rule has not kicked in for me yet. So I hope that there are no issues. Uh, I have changed the title of this slightly from the title that Kathy read out. Basically the same idea framed a little bit differently. Can there be ethical propaganda? I wanna ask what the church fathers have to offer for understanding an ethic of public rhetoric. I love this picture here on the screen. Um, of course, it's a parody. The Nazis actually did not use images of Jesus in that way, but in a way they did. So it's almost a parody that's disturbingly more true than you realize once you see how the image of the Northern European white Scandinavian Aryan Jesus uh, has influenced conceptions of Christianity and Christian ethics. So just to introduce the topic here, I wanna give you a quote from John Lilly. He says, the rules of fair play do not apply in love and war. But the question I ask is, do they apply in rhetoric? It is tempting to assume that provided we abstain from strictly defined dishonesty and threats, any method used to persuade other people of our beliefs is acceptable or even noble. However, in what follows, I will argue that this simple answer does not work well. Using a stream of Christian thought that stems from patristic writers such as Cyprian of Carthage and Tatian, I will argue the claim that we have a moral, or I will make the claim that we have a moral obligation to carefully interrogate and sometimes reject certain techniques of persuasion prevalent in rhetoric because these techniques can create an unstable epistemic environment. After making this case, I will respond to Augustine's apparent disagreement with my argument and then show how Augustine's actual views offer a pathway toward an ethical paradigm for rhetoric. I wanna begin by just briefly going over some of the views of the church fathers on the subject of rhetoric. Of course, uh, in the actual paper on um, which this presentation is based, there's a lot more that can be gone into here can't cover all the church fathers' views on rhetoric in just 18 minutes, but this is just a little snippet. Although all the theologians in the first three centuries of the church utilized worldly philosophical truths, the pagan aesthetic of communication in which those truths were expressed was nevertheless viewed suspiciously. There were two primary reasons for this. The first was the association of pagan rhetoric with false deities. The second, and perhaps less well-known reason for rejecting rhetoric was more nuanced. Rhetoric, they argued, used force and manipulation as its means of communication, while Christians should persuade by facts. Cyprian of Carthage affords one example of this point of view when he says in his letter to Donatus that in courts of law, in public meetings, in political discussions, a full eloquence may be the pride of vocal ambition, but in speaking of the Lord God, a pure simplicity of expression, which is convincing, depends upon the substance of the argument rather than the forcefulness of eloquence. What is the merit of, as Cyprian says, pure simplicity of expression? Later in the text, as he proceeds through a litany of the vices of humanity, Cyprian explains why imitating the popular style of the forum is not virtuous. In the courts of law, one might expect to find justice and nobility, yet Cyprian says wrong is done in the midst of the laws themselves. Wickedness is committed in the very face of the statutes. Innocence is not preserved even in the place where it is defended. By turns, the rancor of disputants rages and when peace is broken among the togas, the forum echoes with the madness of strife. One's patron, he makes a feint and deceives. The judge, but he sells his sentence. He who sits to avenge crimes commits them, and the judge becomes the culprit in order that the accused may perish innocently. Here, according to Cyprian, eloquence prov provides the facade behind which all these justices may be perverted. In Cyprian's mind, brilliant rhetoric becomes merely a tool for hiding falsehood. If one speaks the truth, one does not need it. A similar may, attitude may be found in Jerome, who swore off eloquence and claimed to have completely forsaken Gentile books, though, like some sort of addict, he seems to have returned to them at times. 
In his own aspirations, at least, he, quote, says, we do not wish for the field of rhetorical eloquence nor the snares of dialecticians, but the very words of scripture must be set down. Basil of Caesarea and Gregory Nazianzus offer similar assessments of rhetoric, the former arguing that it leads to, quote, sophistic vanities. It is, however, in Tatian's oration against the Greeks that we find the most robust Christian condemnation of rhetoric. Holding nothing back in his allegations, Tatian says, you, the Greeks, have too contrived the art of rhetoric to serve injustice and slander, selling the free power of your speech for hire, and often representing the same thing at one time as right, at another time as not good. Later in his diatribe, he accuses the Greek rhetoricians of polishing language as a means of hiding its vacuity. Why do you handle the builder's tools without knowing how to build, he says. Why do you busy yourselves with words while you keep aloof from deeds, puffed up with praise, but cast down by misfortunes? Finding you to be such men as these, we have abandoned you and no longer concern ourselves with your tenets, but follow the word of God. Why, O oh man, do you set the letters of the alphabet at war with one another? Why do you, as in a boxing match, make their sounds clash together with your mincing attic way of speaking, whereas you ought to speak more according to nature? For if you adopt the Attic dialect, though not an Athenian, pray, why do you not speak like the Dorians? How is it that one appears to you more rugged, the other more pleasant for intercourse? The Attic way of speaking Tatian refers to here was the result of a determined study, the art of lofty, overwhelming verbal power. In an era in which the spoken word was viewed as the pinnacle of human communication, Tatian argues that the Vogue methods of persuasion were problematic because they could be used to make unbelievable things believable. Therefore, the simple word was good enough. Now I turn to the ethical assessment of all this. At one level, this argument seems to have an easy rebuttal. If the problem with rhetoric is that it can be used to dishonest ends, we should just avoid aiming at those ends. Furthermore, if I am a good person who does not wish to deceive others, my use of propaganda should only accomplish honest, good things. However, upon closer examination, this answer seems to reveal problems. There are some types of propaganda, uh, and by the way, in this presentation, I don't go into a detailed definition of propaganda, but we would typically just define it in a broad way as any efforts to use rhetoric in order to inculcate a persuasive mentality. Um, there are different definitions which I go into in the project. You can ask about them later. Um, there are some types of propaganda which are at the level of content honest, but still seem to involve efforts to create false perceptions in their recipients. I want to give you some examples here. In the realm of advertising, consider the use of misleading labels. The seller of a food product, which is manifestly unhealthy, may place terms such as fat-free and source of vitamin A on the item's container. If the product does in fact contain more than negligible amounts of fat uh, and contains uh, some quantity of vitamin A, we would judge these claims to be true. Nevertheless, the intended effect of the communication is to make the shopper assume that the product is health promoting when this may be the opposite of the case. We might say that the parts of this propaganda are truthful while the whole is not. This example is not an isolated rare case. Our world is rife with factual statements which are technically correct but are assembled or presented in such a way as to distort reality. This of course raises an important question. Are there types of propaganda that do not deceive? Here the answer is obviously yes. Returning to the example of advertising labels, we can easily imagine a food product which is in fact health promoting and is also marketed with factual descriptions of its salubrious properties. For example, any of the items on this screen. Still, this possibility does not resolve the problem that gradually emerges as the practitioner of communication arts improves in skill. This problem is that every tool useful for honest communication can be used even more effectively for dishonest communication. Furthermore, in many cases, it is already easier to tell a lie than the truth. And it becomes even easier when incredible tools of manipulative presentation have been mastered. Returning to the marketing example, 
Imagine that a food item is actually very unhealthy. My favorite example of this would be potato chips, which I love. Let's say that the producers and sellers have two options to market this item. A, if they want to present it as healthy, they can in fact change the product so that it becomes healthy by altering the ingredients or the manufacturing process. Or B, they can change the advertising label so that the healthy, unhealthy item appears more nutritious, perhaps by using statistics like 80% less fat than alternative, even if the fat content is, is still quite large. The question that uh, presents itself is, which of these options will be easier? Clearly, while option A requires massive overhauling of budgets and production formulas, option B only requires simple changes in language. In a capitalist economy, the temptation to alter the rhetoric becomes simply too strong to resist. And I don't have time to go into this, but the same phenomenon holds true in other areas of business, politics, as well as relationships. Even if the messages delivered through artful rhetoric are not intentionally deceiving, these messages may still be malicious or harmful to its recipients. The pathway from rhetoric to destructive propaganda that the church fathers first recognized is unobstructed. Now I turn to a possible counter from another important, if not one of the most important church fathers, Augustine. Unlike the other church fathers, Augustine's attitude toward rhetoric is more ambiguous. In his confessions, he seems to condemn it, calling his former professorship in rhetoric the seat of mendacity. But in his treatise on Christian doctrine, he mounts a robust defense of this art form, arguing that it plays a crucial role in promoting the truth of the gospel. His argument is stirring. Since rhetoric, he says, is used to give conviction to both truth and falsehood, who could dare to maintain that truth, which depends on us for its defense, should stand unarmed in the fight against falsehood? And I will skip down here. He gives a, a very rhetorically brilliant defense of this, but for the sake of time, his conclusion is, who could be so senseless as to find this sensible? Classic Augustinian wordplay. Notwithstanding his exaggerations, Augustine's argument in basic form seems convincing. Truth ought to receive the best presentation available, and the rhetorical arts are needed for that. Some scholars have therefore concluded that Augustine provides a general endorsement of rhetoric, particularly as modeled by Cicero. However, far from simply giving Christian communicators free reign to use any form of rhetoric whatsoever, Augustine presents a nuanced perspective. Later in On Christian Doctrine, he admits that there is a deceitful type of rhetoric, which even the heathens recognize. Elsewhere, Augustine makes a distinction between wisdom and eloquence. He says, eloquent speakers give pleasure, wise ones salvation. For Augustine, therefore, both good and bad styles of rhetoric existed, and Christians should use the good. This raises the question, what is a good style of rhetoric for Augustine? Although Augustine declines to expound on rhetorical methods, he gives an answer when he addresses the question of whether the divine scriptures should be pronounced just wise or eloquent as well. His answer, as you can see, is that they are both wise and eloquent, but eloquent in a way that is different from the teachers of rhetoric. Concerning the rhetoric scriptural authors used, Augustine observes that all who correctly understand what these writers are saying realize that it would not have been right for them to express it in any other way. They possess a beauty of expression which emerges not from any external techniques used for framing their message, but from the substance of the message itself. Their style is appropriate to them, and the humbler it seems, the more thoroughly it transcends that of the others, not in grandiloquence, but in substance. The eloquence of the scriptural writers is good because it arises from the content of the message, its truth. The message is appealing and attractive, but not due to any superficial coding, and the appeal would not exist without the truth of the message. There is yet another quality of good rhetoric Augustine presents in Unchristian Doctrine. 
The goals of Christian rhetoric are more expansive, he says, than those of classical communicators. In the rhetorical arts, the end goal stops at conveying the message and influencing the recipient to accept a particular viewpoint. In Augustine's view, the goal of communication is much more, the promotion of caritas through a transformation of the self. The sections of unchristian doctrine that address rhetoric cannot be read apart from the first section of the volume, which argues that the entire purpose of Christian exposition is to build up the double love of God and neighbor. In short, Greco-Roman rhetoricians sought merely to move their audiences. Christian rhetoricians must love them. Here I then now move into an application. Is there a role for Augustine's vision of rhetoric in 21st century communication ethics? This question is incredibly important because the techniques of persuasion available today vastly outnumber those of the patristic era. Cicero had poetry and pathos. We have a long list of tools that runs the gamut from impassioned Facebook posts to rapid fire statistics from cable news networks. How do we determine which of these are ethical? Of course, any answer to this question will involve innumerable details and nuances, which I have no space to address here. Nevertheless, I think a few major points emerge from the above assessment of rhetoric in the church fathers. First, a Christian ethic of propaganda call for techniques of persuasion to arise from the inherent truth of the position being promoted. This may seem like a banal point, but it requires careful thought because many contemporary techniques of persuasion function by sidelining the pursuit of truth. A classic example of this is the small print in advertisements and contracts intended to conceal the true and usually alarming nature of the commodity or contract being promoted. In political discourse, truth may be sidelined when a speaker shows only one side of a particular cause or issue rather than honestly recognizing the ambiguity of most political disputes. Paradoxically, by prioritizing truth over blunt persuasiveness, we may find that our voice becomes more trusted and hence more persuasive. Any Christian ethic of propaganda requires a disavowal of any method of public communication that, either through intention or side effect, causes its audiences to think less about the truth of the message. The second contribution of the Church Fathers, and especially Augustine, to a Christian ethic of communication is an emphasis on caritas as the criterion for acceptable rhetoric. A simple exhortation to speak more lovingly may sound like trite moralism, but when applied to rhetorical methods, it means much more than simply using gentle language. Caritas-driven rhetoric persuades by appealing to and building on the love of neighbor within the recipient. The best way to explain how this type of rhetoric works is by contrast. Commonly, technicians of persuasion appeal to their recipient's self-interest as the primary source of motivation. An advertiser emphasizes that you will save money if you buy a certain product. A politician boasts that you will see decreasing taxes if you elect him or her. A preacher promises that you will be saved if you accept his message. Of course, there is nothing wrong with making such promises if they are indeed true, but a rhetorician operating with a patristic model of communication would not place self-interest as the key hook within the message. Rather, such a rhetorician would show how accepting and applying a given idea or course of action can enable the recipient to better love the world. The difference would be one of emphasis, but it would still be substantial. The advertiser would show how a product might make you a better parent or friend. The politician would argue that her tax policies will benefit the most needy. The preacher would proclaim that accepting his message will enable you to save others through acts of tangible caritas, feeding the hungry, caring for the sick, clothing the naked, and so on. In summary then, in a world swirling with questionable forms of propaganda, these two rhetorical strategies could have a dramatic impact on the way we think about the task of convincing others. The Church Fathers' insistence that there are indeed harmful styles of rhetoric combined with Augustine's positive injunction to use rhetoric whose beauty arises from its truth and whose appeal is rooted in caritas give us a pathway for persuasion that may reduce the chronic distrust and vertiginous paranoia that plague our social media age. We do well to lend them our ears.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. Wonderful. Uh, that's incredibly helpful that uh, that will have a few questions uh, raised. And again, as in previous sessions, if you have questions, uh, if you'd put them in the chat uh, to me, I will have them uh, for when we get to the end and have some Q&A. With that, I want to turn to our next presenter, who is Danis Madison. Danis is a PhD candidate in our integrative studies in ethics and theology. She's currently writing her dissertation, and as most of us know, no small undertaking, and that dissertation seeks to deconstruct moral identity defined by coloniality and it envisions a decolonial character ethics approach for white Christians seeking to delink from structures of domination. Dennis is also a founding member of EncounterPoint, a faith community in Chicago's Edgewater neighborhood that provides liturgy experiences as well as hospitality for individuals and groups seeking to deepen their spiritual journeys and further their social justice projects. And I have participated in some of those and can certainly attest to how wonderful it is. And Dennis's past experiences as a healthcare justice advocate, a campus minister and intentional community member and other outreach ministry roles inspire her scholarly pursuits and shape her interest in bridging ethical reflection with concrete solidarity and justice work. And today, Dennis is going to talk about creative disobedience, delinking virtue from racial and religious supremacies. Dennis, all yours. Thank you so much, Kathy. Okay, can everyone see and hear what you need to see and hear? Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much um, to the Hank Center for um, and the theology department for sponsoring this event. And thank you to Megan Toomey and Kathleen McNutt for organizing it. And again, thanks to Kathy for being willing to moderate this session. When we see images from the storming of the Capitol, oh, and I also wanted to give a quick shout out to the students of Theo 100 who are here, and I'm so glad you're here. Um, so to begin, when we see images from the storming of the Capitol on January 6, images of nooses next to Jesus signs and crosses, those of us who identify as white Christians wonder how to respond. Sometimes we want to distance ourselves from quote unquote, those people telling ourselves that they are not real Christians or even real patriots. Other times we might find ourselves completely incapacitated in a state of self punishment for seeing quote unquote, our own people participating in so much violence and hate. Well, in my research, um, I look to Dorothy Zola for a model of how white Christians in the US might exercise responsibility and repair in the face of racial and religious supremacies and how we might cultivate the spiritual and moral stamina to stay in the struggle of dismantling races, racial and religious supremacies, even as we continue to see ourselves in a very dark and ugly mirror, like the prior image. Dorothy Zola was born in Germany and came of age during the Nazi regime. Her family hid a Jewish woman in her attic. She writes about that in her autobiography and she writes about remembering going to bed hungry many nights during the war time. In the 50s, she taught religion at a Catholic high school in Germany and um, this was a major moment for her. She was dismayed to find that the children she taught told how their parents were attempting to forget 
that the genocide had even happened by repeating, repeating tropes about how under Hitler, at least the roads and infrastructure improved. This led Zola to become a theologian um, and through her scholarship really grapple with Christian participation in oppression and genocide in Germany. In her work, Zola uncovers a common theological thread among three groups of Christians she identifies, three very different groups, which were um, functioning during um, the Nazi time in Germany. The German Christians were the um, sort of institutional church that became um, an actual arm of the Nazi state. The church in resistance led by church leaders like Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who we will hear about in a little bit. And then the intellectual bourgeoisie was the third group um, who were more so cultural Christians than anything else. Um, so in grappling with how German Christians, um, all of these different sectors of German Christians allowed for and participated in genocide and war, she targets commonly held moral language across this broad spectrum of Christianity that she describes because she believes this would uncover um, a reason behind why Christian resistance against Nazism um, was not strong enough to persuade the majority of German Christians to dissent. The common thread she found weaving um, these three sectors together was the virtue of obedience. Obedience in all three of these sectors from the Christian Nazis to the Christians in resistance used language of obedience to persuade Christians to either act for or against Hitler. Zola believed that it would be this language of obedience that needs to be eradicated from the Christian imagination and from Christian moral systems to cultivate a spirituality and moral identity um, that more effectively confronts um, injustice. Now, let me be clear, and I know it's not very popular to critique Bonhoeffer, but Zola had profound um, respect for him. She regarded him as a theological father. She writes about him um, a lot. And, um, but it's not, so it's not Bonhoeffer she's targeting at all. It's the language of obedience that she's targeting here in all of these different sectors of Christianity. She said in, in the sixties in a book called Creative Disobedience, Surely it is no longer possible to speak of obedience with a sense of theological innocence. Can one demand a particular stance toward God and educate toward that stance, yet simultaneously criticize that same stance toward people and toward institutions? I suspect that we Christians today have the duty to criticize the entire concept of obedience and that this criticism must be radical. It is no longer possible to describe our relationship to God with a formal concept that is limited to the mere performance of duties. We cannot remove ourselves from history if we wish to speak seriously about God. And in our Christian history, our history of the 20th century, obedience has played a catastrophic role. Whoever forgets this background or pushes it aside and naively attempts to begin with obedience as if it were merely a matter of obeying the right Lord has not learned a thing from history. So in Zola's argument, um, she wants to deconstruct the function of obedience socially um, as well as spiritually. She says it upholds an authoritarian image of God as commanding and demanding obedience to God's will. She says that the Christian then um, in obedience acts out of duty to obey and sometimes does not understand why they are carrying out a certain act. They just know that they are told to do so. 
Obedience further sets up a dynamic between God and the individual defined by power over or dominance. Zola fears that a dominating divine human dynamic fosters a spiritual submissiveness among Christians and relating to God as all powerful results in relating to the self as nothing without God, completely disempowering one's self um, and potential to act, to transform. And this authoritarian dynamic ends up reinforcing social structures of hierarchies in society. Zola fears that the Christian is so used to submitting to God, they tend to cling to other sources of power in the world, such as economic, sexual, or racial power. A spirituality and a moral identity centered on obedience further molds Christians' social character or their attitudes and behaviors in society as apathetic, alienated, and cynical. And she goes beyond um, the Third Reich and is critical of um, consumeristic society in the, in the 80s, um, 70s, 80s, and 90s. She starts writing about this. Within a consumeristic culture, being formed by obedience can actually morph into the compulsion to define ourselves in capitalistic terms, confined to seeing life as defined by um, production and consumption. We feel disempowered to take on social, political social and political challenges. This is kind of her ultimate concern because our constant state of spiritual submission um, and so we numb ourselves against neighbor's suffering through consumerist impulses, according to Zola. When Christians prioritize the virtue of obedience, personal disempowerment and apathy um, are not the only results though. A more extreme social and political pattern surfaces creating um, a Christo-fascist society as she terms it. This happens when authoritarian images of God and blind obedience combine with white supremacy and extreme nationalism. <clears throat> when Christians were formed, um, excuse me, when Christians are formed morally to obey, they tend to be swayed towards extremist leaders because they have not learned how to trust their own conscience, only to obey orders. This is um, what Zola saw happen in Germany with Hitler, and she also um, observed its emergence in the 1980s in the US during her time, her tenure at um, Union Theological Seminary. So Zola ultimately argues that we must no longer form our moral identities in relation to a commander God, but in a way that fosters creative um, and courageous concepts of the self that equip us for difficult work like reckoning with our ancestral and present day ties to racial and religious supremacies. She introduces a counter virtue of creative disobedience, which is actually more of a cluster of virtues that include healthy self-fulfillment um, and engender interconnection and solidarity. There is so much to say here, um, but you'll have to read my dissertation to learn more about this facet of Zola's work. After all, we only have about 15 minutes. <laughs> but in my project, um, I show <clears throat> how Zola's critique of centering the virtue of obedience and how it relates to her warning against Christo-fascism parallels today's rendering of Christian nationalism in the United States. I highlight a recent sociological study of Christian nationalism in the US, which emphasizes three ideological pillars upon which Christian nationalism is built, power, boundaries, and order, and very specific interpretations of these structures. So just as Zola found obedience to be the common thread um, weaving through German Christians during the Nazi regime. I claim in my research that these three ideological pillars 
um, support Christian nationalism and can surface in Christianity in much less extreme forms. In fact, we do not need to espouse Christian nationalism to accommodate and proliferate these um, structures in our communities through upholding particular forms of power, boundaries, and social order, we are reinforcing patterns of racial and religious supremacy, even when they appear to have nothing to do with race. Insta instances in which we reinforce these ideological patterns can become red flags that signal supremacist attitudes and behaviors. So I'm going to break down these three structures. Um, in terms of power, for example, we may not, um, so many Christians may not, may say we don't worship an authoritarian leader like um, a lot of people saw Trump to be, but we can accommodate hierarchies in our church communities and other organizations. Um, we often submit to someone else's authority or claim it um, for ourselves, or we view ourselves as entitled to something just by virtue of our status. Um, a simple example would be top-down leadership. Sometimes this can, this can be a red flag where one or very few people have control and the majority contribute time and energy but do not hold decision-making power. This could be a red flag signaling um, a supremacist pattern of power. We, when we find ourselves demarcating boundaries between us and them, we are perpetuating supremacist ideology. Fear of difference can have a much more subtle expression and can even be translated in benevolent terms. Sometimes it is expressed in language of security, but fixating on security and defining security through, through borders, um, boundaries, walls, and, fixate, and fixation on securing finances and property can signal a supremacist attitude. Whenever we prioritize property over people, we are reinforcing this security mindset. Making something secure is a demarcation of boundaries because it always implies we are securing something or someone from someone else. Mutual aid organizations, um, organizers critique the charity models, reinforcement of boundaries between the um, givers and the receivers and say that it reinforces white saviorism and implements barriers to access as um, those at the decision-making level control who receives and who deserves to receive. Maintaining particular, um, a particular social order. This one is a lot more specific, uh, this third pillar, um, is the final pillar of Christian nationalism. And it is a social order that envisions the family and the pater familias as a microcosm of how all of society should be envisioned. It surfaces in constant ma maintenance of heteropatriarchy and views LGBTQIA plus people, as well as women claiming reproductive rights as a threat to society. But these ideals crop up in Christian communities across denomination and political affiliation, not just Christian nationalism. When we repeat the status quo of heteropatriarchy, or we find ourselves reinforcing rigid gender roles, homophobia, transphobia, or standing against reproductive rights, we are replicating supremacist ideals around how the social order should be. And when we see these repeated in our communities, they stand as red flags signaling our accommodation of or participation in supremacy. Even in progressive Christian circles, I've been in um, a lot of these kind of atmospheres, we may notice a general feeling of acceptance of non-heterosexual orientations, and yet it's curiously never talked about openly. This is one way we are reinforcing a supremacist social order. A virtue ethics approach which Zola has inspired me to take 
exposes how, as long as we accommodate these particular structures of power, boundaries, and order, we pattern our communities around these structures and we conform to them. They ultimately mold our moral identities more than we might be aware. We may disagree with these patterns of, or ideologies. We may flat out disagree with them, but as long as our communities dance around these patterns and structures, we are being formed by them down to the personal level. The goal of my project, um, inspired by Dorothy Zola's creative disobedience, is to map out an alternative moral identity formation process where we can take seriously the ideological pillars we uphold through our accommodation of them in our communities. And we can enter into a moral identity process that dismantles these, re replacing them through cultivating virtues like um, inter culture, excuse me, cultivating virtues that engender um, interdependence, interconnectedness, and courageous creativity. I think this would be the start to fostering the spiritual and moral stamina we need to respond to both um, implicit forms of racism and religious racial and religious supremacy, um, the extreme instances of these. I'm tripping over my words here at the end. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, that, but we saw these kind of come to a head on January 6th, but I'm trying to say that they can um, surface in much less extreme forms. Um, to end, I ask you the question, <laughs> Where do you see authoritarian power, us, them, boundaries, or the enforcement of heteropatriarchal so social order arise in your community or institution? What might, what might um, alternative relational and organizational patterns look like in your community or institution? Something to ponder. And um, thank you for your attention. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy. Thank you, Dennis. That was wonderful. Again, uh, I'm sure that uh, at least I know I have a couple questions. So uh, if others do, please jot them down so that you can share them uh, when we get to that point in this session. And with that, I will move on to our next presenter, who is Megan Toomey as most of you have already met since she has been uh, helping organize and lead this day long uh, exploration of our theological and ethical frameworks. She's a doctoral candidate in the integrated studies in ethics and theology at Loyola. Her dissertations titled The Meaning of Life's Broken Fragments, Bonhoeffer's Ethics of Resistance, and it catalogs Catholic engagement with the works of Dietrich Bonhoeffer and presents a charism of resistance grounded in Bonhoeffer's incarnational Christology. Megan's additional areas of interest include Catholic ecclesiology, theologies, and political theologians. Prior to LUC, Megan earned a master's degree in systematic theology from Union Theological Seminary, as well as a master's degree in applied development of psychology from Fordham University. And uh, her session, her talk, is going to be on Bonhoeffer's contextual ethics as a model for surviving contingency and crisis in our time. Megan? Thanks, Kathy. Um, everyone can hear me okay? Great. So I'm going to start us off with a quote from Bonhoeffer. Um, I won't respond directly to the uh, um, issue of obedience in Bonhoeffer unless uh, some more gets, gets asked about that, but it's certainly not a unique critique to Zola. There is a um, valid critique of the language of obedience um, that we need to pay attention to in Bonhoeffer's work. Um, <clears throat> Bonhoeffer says that there are specific moments in history which confront us with concrete problems 
set us tasks and charge us with responsibility. What does it mean to say that context, contingency, and crisis are signs of our times? The phrase signs of our times as a sociological idea refers to significant events or trends in a certain historical period. But Catholics know from Vatican II that there is a deeper dimension to this phrase. One that refers to those events and trends in history, which if properly understood, reveal the presence of God, or some would argue, reveal the absence of God. We are talking about the spaces in our history, our, our world, and our life that if understood correctly, reveal or conceal the movement of the spirit. So in addition to asking what it means to think of context, contingency, and crisis as significant trends in our society, as a Catholic, I also ask whether these trends reveal or obscure God's will. To answer, I turn, perhaps less than obviously, to a 20th century German Protestant theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, whose legacy has been the focus of my research for several years. I believe that his writings and biography have significance for 21st century American Catholicism. To put it differently, I am investigating what signs Bonhoeffer has to offer to our times. Bonhoeffer was born in 1906 in Breslau, Germany, which is now Warsaw, Poland. He was raised in a Lutheran family. As an adult, he became one of the founders and leading figures in the Confessing Church of Germany, a church that assembled on the basis of resistance to Nazism, as um, Danis was talking about. One of the things for which Bonhoeffer is most well known is his martyrdom. He was executed in a Nazi concentration camp in 1945. Martyrdom is arguably a common claim to fame in Christianity, less claim for venerated, less common rather for venerated Christian leaders, however, is the distinction of being a would-be assassin. Bonhoeffer was executed for participating in an underground conspiracy that aimed to overthrow the sitting government by killing Germany's political leader, Adolf Hitler. An interesting life choice for a devout Christian and professed pacifist. Bonhoeffer was a theologian, a scholar, a seminary teacher. Above all, he was a pastor. He was a man deeply committed to his faith, a devout disciple of Christ. Given this, it would not be unreasonable to assume that when faced with the context of contingency and crisis in Nazi Germany, Bonhoeffer abandoned his faith and his pacifist beliefs. But that would be an incorrect assumption based solely on a superficial consideration of his actions. Much to the contrary, for Bonhoeffer, deciding to take part in an illegal underground conspiracy that culminated in a plot to assassinate Hitler was an expression of his Christian discipleship. To understand this, we'll examine some of Bonhoeffer's writings, essays that were published after his death under the title Ethics. In these essays, Bonhoeffer points out that concrete ethical problems define his generation. In response, Bonhoeffer wrestles with an ethics that embraces not only concrete reality, but also the ambiguity and contingency that is inherent to human existence and is especially palpable during times of crisis. In 1939, a time that was quickly becoming one of the greatest periods of persecution in Germany, and when the threat of being called for active military duty haunted all German men, some friends and colleagues of Bonhoeffer are arranged for him to escape Germany by taking a position in New York. In conversation with his good friend, George Bell, Bonhoeffer wrestled with whether he should stay safely in New York or return to Germany. Bonhoeffer scholar Samuel Wells tells us that what Bell helped Bonhoeffer to see was that there was no solution to his predicament. He was going to have to live without a solution. He was called to find a way to be with his people not in dramatic and conclusive decision, but in an extended series of daily discernments. Bonhoeffer decided to return to Germany. In a letter to Reinhold Niebuhr, he explained, I have made a mistake in coming to America. I must live through this difficult period of our national history with the Christian people of Germany who will face the terrible alternative of either willing the defeat of their nation in order that Christian civilization may survive or willing the victory of their nation and thereby destroying our civilization. 
I know which of these alternatives I must choose, but I cannot make the choice in security. Bonhoeffer not only realized that there is not always clear right or wrong answers to ethical questions, but also he embraced this uncertainty. That is, he embraced the contingency of his situation, the contingency of the world and of his own existence. The following year, Bonhoeffer experienced another moment of crucial decision-making when France surrendered to German forces in June, 1940. This was a definitive blow for the Nazi resistance movement. The network of resistance allies at home and abroad crumbled. Anyone still willing to resist Nazi domination was forced underground. Wells explains that the victory in France had set the seal on an immense miscalculation that Hitler's methods and his estimate of the enemy would be unsuccessful. What the moment really meant for Bonhoeffer was that he and his circle were confronted with the horrifying truth that no one was going to get rid of Hitler for them. If they wanted Hitler gone, they would have to do it themselves. In that moment, Bonhoeffer knew that the choice was not about whether to surrender resistance efforts, but it was about how to change their way of resisting. Bonhoeffer wrote the first essays for his book Ethics over the course of 1939 and 1940. Beginning with an essay titled The Love of God and the Decay of the World, Bonhoeffer sought to discredit the notion that the task of Christian ethics is to distinguish between good and evil. Instead, he argued that it is actually the knowledge of good and evil that constituted an essential disunity between humans and God, as well as a disunity in human relationships with each other and with an individual's relationship to themselves. He proposes that the only way to heal this disunity is by knowing Jesus as he is displayed in events, concepts, and principles which are intelligible to us in the Christian gospels. I'll say more about that later. In Church in the World, the second essay Bonhoeffer wrote between 1939 and 1940, he goes on to address the question of Jesus's relationship to good people and goodness. What he does really is offer a scathing critique of common understandings of the words success and good, and especially a critique of associating those two words exclusively with each other. That which is good is successful, that which is successful is good. He wants to critique these. Bonhoeffer explains that human ideas about acting good are necessarily misgiven pointing again to the fact that it was the original apprehension of knowledge of good and evil in the Garden of Eden that fractured human relationships. Building on these insights, Bonhoeffer presents the core of his ethical framework in History and the Good, which is an essay written during the climax of Bonhoeffer's activity in the anti-Nazi underground conspiracy. So uh, between 1941 and 43. Using the categories of goodness and responsibility in distinct ways, Bonhoeffer argues that there is no such thing as goodness in the way that humans have understood it. According to him, a responsible person, and by responsible person, Bonhoeffer means a faithful Christian disciple, does not seek good based on their own knowledge, which is disconnected from God. The responsible disciple rather seeks only the will of God to direct their actions and attitudes. Bonhoeffer concluded that good is only found in the embodied action of the form of Christ in different circumstances. Bonhoeffer offers a distinct understanding of God's will here. For him, God's will is not universal or communal as are other ethical codes, such as the Decalogue, which prescribes behaviors and attitudes that all humans should model. Bonhoeffer explains that responsible action is not justified by any law. It is performed performed in ignorance of good and in the surrender to God, for it is God who sees the heart, who weighs up the deed, and who directs the course of history. For him, God's will is diverse and contextual, working from within individual circumstances to form human beings. Thus, Christian discipleship is a matter of becoming the form of Christ. Ethics is active embodied formation in relationship with Christ. Bonhoeffer explains, ethics as formation then means the bold endeavor to speak about the way in which the form of Jesus Christ takes form in our world, 
in a manner which is neither abstract nor causistic, neither programmatic nor purely speculative. Concrete judgments and decisions will have to be ventured here. Decision and action can here no longer be delegates to the personal conscience of the individual. Here, there are concrete commandments and instructions for which obedience is demanded. Bonhoeffer's point is that ethics is something you do, not something you cognitively formulate into principles or laws. Therefore, in order to understand Bonhoeffer's decision to participate as a conspirator in a plot to kill Hitler, we must adopt his perspective, where God's will is a contextually diverse and individualized reality, and where active participation, participation in that reality is the definition of ethics. The question we must now address is whether Bonhoeffer's understanding of ethics allows for murder to be part of God's will. Did Bonhoeffer's theological ethics justify his actions undertaken within the framework of conspiracy? The underlying foundation of my answer to this question is the assumption that Bonhoeffer deliberately acted with volition and foresight. In Confession of Guilt, which Bonhoeffer wrote while still engaged in the conspiracy, he asserts that the structure of responsible action includes readiness to accept guilt. This is one of the first insta instances where Bonhoeffer proposes guilt as a prerequisite to acting responsible, that is, to being a true disciple of Christ. Disciples must be willing to take on guilt, guilt up for their own sins and for the sins of others. This is where the deeply incarnational Christocentrism of Bonhoeffer's theological ethic emerges. He emphasizes that it is solely love which makes Jesus incur guilt. From Jesus's selfless love, from his freedom from sin, Jesus enters into the guilt of humans and takes this guilt upon himself. Christ's original and true worldly form is the image of the crucifixion. When Bonhoeffer speaks of confirmation to Christ's form, it is this form of the incarnate crucified one. He describes this confirmation as a faith that changes with experience. Whoever burdens himself or herself with guilt through a responsible deed without regarding their own life will have a faith that consists only of surrendering entirely to God while hoping for mercy. So as with Christ, the fate of Christian disciples is unavoidably to become guilty. It's important to understand that Bonhoeffer does not mean guilt in a metaphorical or abstract sense. He explains when one takes guilt upon themselves in discipleship, they answer for it. They accept responsibility for it in some way. That is that disciples act in ways that incur real world consequences for actions of guilt and incur real feelings of guilt. This is truly what Bonhoeffer embodies when he takes part in the underground conspiracy and plot to assassinate Hitler. In all of the writings that came out of Tegel prison where Bonhoeffer was held from 1943 to 1944 after his arrest, there is not one attempt to justify the actions for which he was imprisoned. In fact, over the course of the 18 months Bonhoeffer spent in prison, he wrote at least three different letters in which he emphasized the fact that he had no regrets. In a December 1943 letter, he writes, I can, I hope, bear all things in faith, even my condemnation and even the other consequences that I fear. But faithless vacillation, endless deliberation without action, refusal to take any risks, that's a real danger. Even when he is imprisoned, he does not lose his faith. And I think that it's also important to point out that when Bonhoeffer is talking about condemnation and other consequences, he's not just talking about the fact that he's imprisoned and may be executed. He's talking about those consequences that come for true believers after death as well, where God is the final judge of all actions. So Bonhoeffer was executed in a Nazi concentration camp in Flossenburg in April, 1945. Several of Bonhoeffer's co-conspirators and friends and three other members of his family were executed on the same day. Bonhoeffer's parents and his fiance did not find out about his death until months later um, because they happened to be listening to a radio program that announced it. 
Many scholars have suggested that much like his writings, Bonhoeffer's life was a fragmented and unfinished masterpiece. Unfinished, perhaps. Fragmented, surely not. In Bonhoeffer's own words, the Christian cannot split up his life or dismember it. And the a common denominator must be sought both in thought and in a personal and integrated attitude to life. The person who allows themselves to be torn into fragments by events and by questions has not passed the test of the present or the future. German life had been torn into fragments. Traditional 19th century German culture was bulldozed over by the national socialism of the Nazis. Nazi ideology turned German people against their own compatriots. Europe itself was covered in fragments of buildings destroyed by bombs, chunks of earth ripped apart by war, fragments of human flesh. Communication platforms collapsed. The business of daily life was shattered. Families were split apart. And that is to say nothing of the experience of Jewish people. The millions of people who were systematically stripped of their homes, their rights, their religion, their relationships, relationships, loved ones, bodies, their health, their lives. In the face of such suffering, crisis, and contingency, Bonhoeffer poignantly asked if there has ever before in human history been people with so little ground under their feet. Somehow despite the world fragmented by evil, torn apart by human folly, devastated by our anthropocentric arrogance of attempting to know and impose goodness, Somehow Bonhoeffer kept his faith. He was not torn apart. And this is the promise that Bonhoeffer's ethics offers to Catholics in the United States today. He may offer only fragments of a life or moments of lived ethics that serve as the foundation of a theological ethics, but it is the compass of Christian discipleship. Bonhoeffer says that the important thing today is that we should be able to discern from the fragment of our life, how the whole was arranged and planned and what material it consists of. For really there are some fragments that are only worth throwing into the dustbin and others whose importance lasts for centuries because their completion can only be a matter for God. And so they are fragments that must be fragments. If our life is but the remotest reflection of such a fragment, if we accumulate at least for a short time a wealth of themes and weld them into a harmony in which the great counterpoint is maintained from start to finish. So that at last, when it breaks off abruptly, we can sing no more than the choral, choral, I come before thy throne. We will not bemoan the fragmentariness of our life, but rather rejoice in it. I can never get away from Jeremiah 45. It is a necessary fragment of life, but I will give you your life as a prize of war. Thank you, Megan. It was wonderful. It made me think of uh, the novel I'm using in my dissertation, uh, where the main character ends up choosing to do something that is out of uh, alignment with the Catholic Church in which he has been raised. Uh, so thank you for that. Our last speaker is Dominic Tomasini. Dominic is, I believe, joining us from Africa. Uh, I believe that's where he's currently at. He is a Zimbabwean Jesuit priest working as a dean of the Jesuit School of Theology at Hakima University College in Nairobi, Kenya. He also teaches fundamental theology and ecclesiology in the same school. His research interests include theology and urbanization, African Christian theology, theological hermeneutics, theology and literature, and autobiography as theology. Dominic, welcome. What time is it where you're at? Oh, you need to unmute yourself. Thank you very much, Kathy. I was just saying that the time now is nine minutes after 10 p.m. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's a good hey. time for me because I work at night. Ah, uh, great. 
So, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. First of all, let me say thank you to everyone who is behind this uh, project, uh, this forum, and um, and thank you for remembering me from this far end of the world and being part of, of it. And I'm happy to meet many people here who have been uh, part of my salvation history uh, during my time in Chicago. And um, I, I'm really finding this uh, conversation we are having speaking to, um, to my life of vows. I'm going to prevent, present something on the vow of poverty, um, but everything else that has been said somehow touched on my life of vows. I mean, what Karen presented on this uh, sexual abuses and um, uh, what she even presented on queer, uh, it all speaks to my vow of chastity somehow after. And then there was something on obedience. Again, I've taken vow of obedience. And I think Megan's presentation was somehow similar to what control or what sort of guide our obedience as uh, Jesuits. Uh, which is um, discernment. I find a lot of discernment in what uh, this Bonhoeffer was all about. So this is actually something that is speaking to the depth of my being and thank you very much. Uh, now, let me see if I can go to what I, I would like to share with you. Uh, my topic is um, cash crisis, uh, religious poverty or religious in brackets our poverty as a foundation of a theology of money or for a theology of money. Uh, this work is in progress and it has changed over time since I submitted the topic. And um, due to limited access to the resources that I wanted to use because most places are closed due to the pandemic, I do not have a very a polished paper to present. All I'm going to give you are just, it's just an outline of uh, some thinking around this issue of, um, of, um, of money. Uh, the project started as a way of trying to use religious poverty um, as a way of understanding actual or real poverty. Uh, but then it turned out that religious poverty is more to learn from actual poverty. It's actually, it came out the other way. I thought of all of poverty as religious is a lot to share with the world. But uh, at the end of it, I kind of discovering that, no, we have to learn from poor people. And this work is part of the Jesuit Universal Apostolic Priorities, or what they call UAPs. Uh, since 29, the Jesuits worldwide came up with four priorities which will guide our apostolates um, for the next 10 years. And these um, show a way to God through spiritual exercises, uh, journeying with the youth, working with the poor and the excluded, and taking care of our common home. Um, as they are interpreted, this is not the end, the, the end or what we were trying to achieve, but we are trying to see how these experiences can help us change or transform our lives. So my reflection here on its own poverty, it's on working with the poor, and seeing how working with the poor can change us as Jesuits or as religious and can change everybody else. About um, half a century ago, uh, Gutierrez raised the issue about the relationship between religious poverty and actual poverty. He pointed out uh, paradoxes or ambiguities within these kinds of poverty. Religious poverty is associated with what is termed as spiritual poverty of Matthew chapter five, where we get this phrase, blessed are the poor in spirit. It is about an inner disposition towards material goods. For Jesuits, uh, this disposition is based on the principle and foundation uh, found in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, which states, I'm trying to summarize it here. We are created to save praise and reverence God in order to attain our salvation. All other things are created to help us towards our end, which is to praise, save and um, reverence God. Therefore, we should use things to the extent that they help us towards our end. And uh, we must make our um, 
we must make ourselves indifferent towards every other thing. So what is this indifference? It's indifference, I would rather choose sickness rather than health if sickness helps me towards my end, which is to praise, save, and reverence God. Or I would rather choose poverty than wealth if poverty helps me towards my end. Uh, this is the basic... Um, uh, 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 the basic um, the summary of the principle of and foundation of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And how that indifference is lived out in real life is spelled out in a number of documents that Jesuits, Jesuits use as guidelines in the administration of goods uh, in their custody. Uh, there have been numerous reflections on the spirituality behind each and every action and how it relates to poverty and how it is connected uh, to the principle foundation. And I'm not going uh, into them. All I just want to say is that to show that religious poverty is not destitution and is very different from actual poverty or deprivation with people who have really nothing Gutierrez points out the ambiguity, ambiguities or paradoxes around this, um, uh, this religious poverty. Or I prefer sometimes to call them, to term them insults to people who are really poor. I regard them as insults due to what I've witnessed within my own family and within with my friends and families of many other people that I've ministered to. My brother is always reminding me from time and again that uh, I am not poor. And he said, you as a Jesuit, you are not poor. You know, you have traveled around the world. You have gotten some of the most expensive education. You have all access to, a, and where is poverty in this? And no matter how many times I try to explain to him that my poverty is religious and it's about this, but doesn't mean destitution. He said maybe it's best to call it by another word because uh, it is an insult to people who are real poor. Uh, as Jesuits, and I, I tend to agree with him in a way because as Jesuits, we say, well, we are supposed to live our life as people of slender means, but uh, we go on to say we are not supposed to compromise on things of health, but real poor people, they have no choice, they cannot compromise. So it can become an insult to them when you say you are poor or you have a vow of poverty and yet your life doesn't really reflect that. So Gutierrez proposes some kind of solidarity from the religious. Um, so he says, you know, we have to find some way as religious of being in solidarity with the poor and maybe try to transform life now. Uh, his proposal is in line with the general orientation of his liberation theology, for those of you who know what Gutierrez is, uh, which is about transformation of societies through insertion in poor communities. For me, the danger with such solidarity, at least from my experience here, is that those coming from privileged positions, such as one occupied by the religious, might be blind to what lesser privileged groups can contribute to the desired transformation when we get into the solidarity. Into this solidarity. Um, I'm talking from years as a priest to discover when you try to engage people, people they don't really, they, they expect you to give all the answers because you are a priest. Uh, so this reflection, my reflection, I wish to show that there is something that can come from those who really experience actual poverty or are in abject poverty. They contribute something to the transfer and uh, we have a lot to learn from them. And I'm using the case of how people relate with money to identify this contribution. One might ask, why focus on money? Poverty is far much bigger than money. Yeah, people now they say there are a lot of people who have a lot of money, and but they are poor. Well, the quick answer to that is um, my focus on money is, is, is that uh, it's far much easier to talk about poverty in relation to money than anything else, because this is where most people experience poverty. We can talk of other 
different kinds of poverty, but when you don't have money, you really understand what it means to be poor. But the major reason behind this decision is the experience uh, that explains uh, uh, this topic. It is a very local experience, but I think it has got some global significance. In 2007, every Zimbabwean woke up a billionaire. Hey, but with that billion that you had, a uh, billion dollars, Zimbabwean dollars, it was barely enough to buy a few loaves of bread. That is if they were available. This was the second highest inflation in the history of money after that of Hungary in 1944. For a country like Zimbabwe that had gone, that had one of the strongest currents a few years earlier, this was an unfathomable, uh, was some, an, a tragedy that was difficult to understand. At independence 18 years later in 1980, the Zim dollar or the Zimbabwean dollar was almost equivalent to a US dollar. And many believed that our money was strong and was safe. Uh, so they saved their monies in banks. But overnight with this inflation, their savings and pensions were reduced to nothing. Zimbabwe is yet to recover from that inflation in spite of the many different attempts to stabilize the financial sector. Once the government adopted a multi-current system in which the US dollar was the main currency, a kind of stability and sanity was achieved in the financial sector. Then one day, somebody, the governor of the Reserve Bank, just told people that they were replacing all their money with an equivalent note called a bond note. So this bond note was just a piece of paper equivalent to whatever US dollars you had in your account or whatever your employer owed you. Uh, it was not long before the bond not lost all its values and again all the savings were lost and up to now an average zimbabwean does not trust any so-called zimbabwean currency and they prefer to have their monies in what they call foreign currencies, either british pounds south african rands or us dollars and they don't put them in banks you keep them in your mattress so Zimbabweans live in a state of uncertainty. They don't know whether what they have will be worth anything tomorrow. So that's why there's this rush to try and protect your money and send it outside or somewhere else. The story of misery in Zimbabwe has been told all over, all over media for many years, and you can find it in many academic uh, books. But what I find amazing is that after living, now I'm living in Kenya, it has a stable economy and a very sound financial system, but I still encounter the same story of misery that you find in Zimbabwe. Uh, I've traveled, I've spent some time in Europe. I spent some time four years in Europe and I was in Chicago for five years. And for me, who has looked up to America, the US and, the Brit and Britain for financial assistance, where I was shocked to find out that in those places, there are people who are also begging and are eating from dust bins. So somehow this, what we call the money problem back home is a universal problem. We're finding it here in Kenya and stable economies in Africa, and even in South Africa and Nigeria, which are the leading economies uh, in Africa and find it in Europe and find it in America. There is a money problem everywhere. This is what has led me to thinking about how money works, its value, and how best can we relate to it. Most, history, most books on the history of money trace the complexity of movement from butter trade uh, to cash and to the currencies that we have. They say something about the rise of a gold standard that the value of money has to do with some gold that is stored somewhere in a bank or maybe in a central bank and a reserve bank. But among the economists, there's a different narrative emerging. Um, and uh, financial experts, they are saying that the value of money is not about gold standard, rather it is about trust and hopes and promises that it guarantees. And here I'm following the um, 
uh, the work of some theologian by the name of Philip Goodchild, whose work centers around theology and money. See, the Zimbabwean dollar collapsed not because there was no gold in the banks to guarantee its value, but because the government and the financial institutions could no longer be trusted. The government of Zimbabwe started to print money without making it safe. And how do you make it safe? By promoting production, industry, and viable economic activities, which guarantees that value of money. Corruption and democratic and autocratic government were a major factor in the devaluation of the Zimbabwean dollar. The US dollar and the British pounds are strong and stable because in spite of the problems in their politics, there is a history that what money promises is guaranteed and achieved. The value of money is about a promise and the guarantee of that promise. Take for example, if you go to a, to a bank to get a loan, there's no money sitting somewhere waiting to be given to you. The money will be made available by one institution, which is also guaranteed by data from other institutions. And because there is hope and promise that it will be retained with interest, and it is also available to other data who are involved in economic activities with sustainable productions, and there's enough of consumption of the pro or what is produced. So the reputation of the institutions, as well as the states and governments in which these institutions operate, guarantees that the money and everything will be restored and all that it promises will be achieved. So ultimately, the value of money comes down to faith, trust, and hope. These are very important, uh, important theological terms. It is from this perspective that uh, Professor Goodchild develops a theology of money, where he demonstrates that money is about practice of faith, just like the practice of faith which we seek to understand in theology. Practice is some kind of a practice of faith is some kind of spirituality. And many people do it in different ways. Here in Africa, there are those whose spirituality claim that wealth, such as money, is a sign that you are blessed. And they have a lot of loads of biblical references to support this position. Such spiritualities, we generally refer to them as prosperity gospel. This is one practice of faith in money matters that is controversial and is contested. But I think what the good child proffers is a more credible practice of faith in money, which is parallel in the practice of faith in our churches and in religious communities. Uh, my reflection here, I focus on this practice of faith in money, uh, in money among the poor of the poor. As of now, this reflection is supported by anecdotes because there's not been time and possibility to do some serious systematic study. What emerges from the interactions and observations that I've carried out so far the, among the poor in Zimbabwe and in Kenya is that the value of money is not guaranteed by institutions, neither is it about what I can afford. The value of money is about humanity. I'll give you an example that if you come here and you go to any market, uh, to, to, to any market, you, you find hordes of workers, of people selling a lot of things. They are persuading you, some are even forcing you to buy things and some are kind of cheating and they, there's much, you, you don't want to move along uh, Kibera market just outside from where I am here. The interaction involves a lot of haggling and, and like I said, some cheating, but you know, the people are there, they follow you. And it comes down to a demand to recognize the humanity behind uh, those who are trying to transact something. It is different from a transaction 
uh, which goes on very well in well sanitized supermarkets in, in well to do places. On the other side of the street, there's a very good supermarket. I think it is from France, Carrefour. Everything is clean and nice. And it's different from what you experience when you go to, uh, to Kibera and toy market there. The transaction in this supermarket is so distanced from the individuals involved. And as we know, there are even some places in this supermarket where they self-service. You, you do not have to talk to anyone to make your transaction. You just pick what you want, pay and go out. You only talk to someone only if there is a problem. But otherwise you can do your own thing. And it's very different from what you experience when you go to toy markets. So there are many examples, I don't have time, that I really want to use uh, to show that among the poor people, use of money is not about what I can afford, but about the humanity that it restores. Uh, the point, the value of money among the poor is humanity, or what I call, is what we call here Ubuntu very close to what uh, Pope Francis recently described in Fratelli Tutti. You know, Ubuntu is the, the summary of it is the notion that I am because we are. And it is very different from the Cartesian cogito of I think, therefore I am. Who you are, because there's a very individualistic, it's about you, it's about your creativity, it's about your intellectual skills and that, that makes you. Uh, but in the Ubuntu, so it's about you find your being from being with others. And in such a position, this is not a blind, uh, this is not a blind faith in humanity and its sh sh shadow side, but it is a recognition of the goodness that humanity is capable of. And this is what you see when people, poor people are transacting. It's about well, how does it help me? I spend a lot of time talking to somebody in the market, trying to price it, to bring the price lower and lower. And in that interaction, we really discover that, you know, there's something more about what is going on between, uh, beyond the exchange of the goods and the money. It's about the dignity of this person and also about my dignity. And how best can I, uh, can, can, can we, we, we bring out that dignity. And that's what gives money value. Um, the relationship between poor people and money is a reminder that the value of money lies within our values as human beings and not in the, not in the amount in our bank accounts or uh, inside our mattresses. What you do as human beings raise the value uh, of another human being is what gives your money its value. Some time back, uh, my former college, Arupe College, now Arupe Jesuit University, came up with the issue in one of its journals, uh, Chiesa. And the title of that issue was Africa needs strong institutions, not strong men. This was kind of a reaction to the time of Comrade Mugabe, who seemed to have been controlling everything and many other dictators in Africa who were controlling things and people saying, if we had good institutions, then our life would be better. But from what I'm discovering now, and I said, and from what I've witnessed among the poor in their engagement with money, I think though we need both, but to get our man's worth, what we need are strong men and women, morally and otherwise. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic. That was wonderful. Uh, the Ubuntu concept uh, definitely um, makes a, a lot of sense in terms of thinking in relationality. Uh, these days and, and the forefronting of that over the Cartesian approach. So excellent thinking there. Uh, we have just a minute or so. Um, so I do have one question. Uh, I have multiple questions in the chat, but uh, I'm going to, uh, there's one that 
goes to both Dennis and Megan. So I'm going to uh, present that one. Um, this is from Canoe. Uh, the question is, how would Zola have responded to Bonhoeffer's theological ethics formed and informed by the notion of God's concrete commandment, a la Karl Barth, and vice versa? Is his strong emphasis on obedience, he has that in quotes, to God's commandment somewhat at odd, odds with Zola's theology? How much are they agreeing, disagreeing with each other? Uh, so I will turn it over to Danis and Megan uh, for some reflection on that. Sure, I, I can say something briefly. I think that, um, so generally, uh, something that's important with Bonhoeffer uh, specifically, and um, I think that the Bartian, the Barthian influence, but also you know, sort of the consonance with um, Balthazar is very obvious in Bonhoeffer. Um, I think a lot of the research on Bonhoeffer looks at uh, the concept of continuity versus discontinuity in all different types of, of concepts. So I think there's there's sort of two things in response um, that I have in response. The first is that what what most especially Catholics uh, know about Bonhoeffer is really the Bonhoeffer of sort of popular knowledge and opinion, and that his works reveals uh, sort of a lot more depth and. Um, um, there's a lot more there than than common knowledge. So, so yeah, so is his concept of obedience in agreement or in disagreement with Zola? I might leave that for Danis to answer. What I will say is that I do think that the, the, dis, the points of discontinuity in Bonhoeffer's later work after he encounters suffering in Germany um, re, shows that he is, has reconsidered or he has problematized um, ideas such as obedience. Um, I think the concept of responsibility uh, is probably a lot uh, um, better to latch on to in Bonhoeffer um, towards the end. There was something else I wanted to say, but I can't remember what it is. Dennis, do you have anything? Thanks, Canoe. Um, I'm thinking, yeah, so Zola is going in a very different direction, and she definitely um, wants to walk, um, diverge from the divine command types of theologies. And she follows a little bit more closely with um, H.R. Niebuhr, who was more of like a responsibility ethics. Um, you're responding to the situation. Um, kind of ethics, but I do think she would and does com completely align with um, the contextual side of that. And she also, I think, resonates with Bonhoeffer's idea of ethics as formation, something that you do rather than prescribing principles um, and formulating principles to live by. So it's a yes and no, but it's mostly a no um, <laughs> in terms of whether she aligns with this Bardian divine command ethics. Yeah, so actually, I want to I, I want to add to that really quickly that um, I, I think I that uh, this is what I love about Bonhoeffer is that um, he's such an excellent, excellent example of someone who is um, just just so deeply influenced by his time, right? So it's so it's easy to problematize his language and um, the systematic pieces of his theology when looking back. So um, so to validate Zola's critique, right? There's valid critiques of the patriarchy and the hierarchy and and um, all of that that's in Bonhoeffer's work. And at the same time, he really um, was transforming theology and ethics at the same time as he himself transformed through the context, the, his, his real lived experience, which is what I think makes him such an interesting figure to look at. And, and sorry, and just to add, you know, I'm thinking of Audre Lorde's 
um, argument that you can't um, dismantle the, 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 the master's house with the master's tools. And I think that Bonhoeffer was still using the master's tools. He was still using some of the master's tools, but he was wrestling with them. And, and that's very important. Thank you. Thank you to uh, all of our panelists this afternoon, Andy and Dominic, Dennis and Megan. Uh, wonderful thinking on the um, politically religious and theologically political. Uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Megan to move us on to the final panel of the afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Andy and, and Dominic and Dennis. It's, uh, it's just been wonderful um, being in dialogue with you this afternoon. And, and thank you, Kathy, for facilitating all of it. We are, I'm going to invite you to take um, a four minute break. We're going to start again at 2.45, but join us at 2.44 so you don't miss anything. And we'll have our final panel of uh, the afternoon.